morning harvest. It's, it's, been a, it's been a good time together already, amen? Amen. Those stories, wow. I think something's happening among our youth. What do you think? It's good to see. All right, Acts chapter 12, we're going to finish up this chapter here today. Uh, perhaps uh, some of you have in the past memorized the Ten Commandments, uh, the first of which, and of course, because you memorize them, you're going to know what this one is, right? Yeah, exactly, yeah, exactly, thanks. Thanks for playing along, whoever that was. Um, but here's the, the first of the Ten Commandments is uh, Exodus 23, you shall have no other gods before me, right? Y'all remembered that, right? You shall have no other gods before me. And it's, it's first for a reason. It's, they're not a random assortment of commandments. This is first for a reason because it establishes uh, the foundation for all sin. We remember that you don't become a good believer in God, a good Christian, by obeying the Ten Commandments. That's not the way we come to salvation. It's not the way we curry God's favor. It's not about obeying the Ten Commandments. In fact, the Ten Commandments are largely there to point out the fact that we can't keep them and that we are sinners and that we need a Savior. We need His grace and forgiveness. We can't keep the Ten Commandments. Nevertheless, they stand as the measure of God's holiness uh, before Him. And so, these are the, this one right here is, it sets the foundation, it establishes the foundation for all sin, namely this, pride expressed as a desire for autonomy from God. Pride expressed as a desire for autonomy from God. And I want you to take a moment to think about it. And we've left it up on the screen. And I want you to do some study. And a lot of study of things is just staring at them and reading them over and over again. So I'm gonna give you a moment to do that. I want you to look at the screen, look at that first commandment, and I want you to think about it. We're pausing right here for you to study and meditate on this commandment. And then I'm gonna ask you a question, a quiz question. So study it. You shall have no other gods before me. Now here's the question, ready for it? The question is, which of the other gods are you most likely to put before God himself? Of all the gods in the world, all the possibilities of worship, which of the other gods are you most likely to put before God himself? The answer is very simple. Simply take your finger and point to yourself. Point to yourself. Because you are the God that you are most likely to worship in place of the one true God. As I point to myself, I recognize I I am the God I most adore. I am the God I most want to devote my life to. And this is exactly what played out. If you, if you rewind all the way to Genesis chapter 3 and in the garden and prior to sin entering into the human race, the serpent and Eve are having a conversation really about this very matter, the very matter of the first commandment. And the serpent, Satan, said to her, when you eat of it, speaking of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the one tree God had said, don't eat that one. When you eat of it, the serpent said, your eyes will be opened and you will be like, what's the answer? You'll be like God. You'll be like God. And she ate it. Because she liked the idea of being her own God. Eve liked the idea of having personal autonomy from God. Now listen, this isn't, this, we're not here trolling Eve, okay? We're, we're he, because we like this idea too. We're just like her. We like the idea that we get to be our own God, that we get to dictate the terms, that we are autonomous from God and his righteous demands. And in today's passage, a, a king hears his people shout out to him. We're going to read this in the passage, but they shout out to him, the voice of a God and not of a man. And he liked it. 
and he stole, if, if this were even possible, he stole the glory from, from the God who rightly deserves it. And we're going to see that king's demise as a result of what he did. It's a cautionary story for you and me because, again, the passage says to us, uh, he did not give God the glory and it carried devastating consequences for him. And we're tempted. This is why this is important for us to look at because we're tempted every single day of our lives. We are tempted in the same way. We are not the, the kings of realms. We are not uh, the queens over kingdoms. But you are and I are individuals who face a choice every day, every moment of the day, I can give God the glory or I can steal that glory for myself. So that's what we're going to see in the passage. It's Acts chapter 12, uh, 20 through to the end of the chapter here. I'll read these verses and then we're going to go after this together. Now Herod was angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon and they came to him with one accord and having persuaded Blastus, the king's chamberlain, they asked for peace because their country depended on the king's country for food. On an appointed day, Herod put on his royal robes, took his seat upon the throne and delivered an oration to them. And the people were shouting, the voice of a God and not of a man. And immediately an angel of the Lord struck him down because he did not give God the glory. And he was eaten by worms and breathed his last. But the word of God increased and multiplied and Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had completed their service, bringing with them John, whose other name was Mark. All right, here's what you're going to see on the screen and in the notes. God is glorified in me. This is what we want to go after. How, how is God glorified in me? How do I give God the glory is the other way of saying it. God is glorified in me when I, first of all, know who I am. It's critical that we know who God is, and it's critical that we know who we are. Uh, as human beings. And by this, I mean that we understand uh, the, the divine human org chart. We, we have org charts here at the church for our staff and our leadership to understand responsibilities and authorities and how things work in the church. Ours is more complicated than the divine human org chart, which is really quite simple. You can see this is also called the, just the order of creation. We have God at the top of the org chart, represented by a triangle. He's the triune God. If you understand anything about org charts, usually you have like some supporting uh, structure, some, some committee or some team off to the side, and the angels are like a subcommittee of God. They're, they're like deacons. They do the, the, some of the things that God wants them to do. They serve the Lord. So they're like deacons or this standing committee or subcommittee of God himself. Directly under God is his special creation, humanity the only part of creation that he breathed his own life into. He breathed the spirit into us. I know you love your dogs, but they don't have the spirit of God in them. Okay? Humanity, he breathed his life into human beings. And then to complete the org chart, the natural world, everything in the natural world is under humanity because God gave us dominion over the natural world. So, so the creation is in our hands to steward. And what this means, and this is bonus material, but what that means is as managers of the creation, we don't worship the creation, but also we don't exploit the creation. And a good Christian has a perspective from the word of God about how we manage the environment and the creation and all that God has made. So, so we, we don't worship our dogs, but neither do we exploit them and hate them. We're just really happy that God gave them to us for those of us that are dog people. You know what I'm saying? Okay, we don't exploit, we don't, we don't worship the creation, we don't exploit the creation, it's, it's under us. That was all free, it has nothing to do with the rest of the message, okay? So you just note that, it just seemed like a good opportunity to say it. But this org chart, here's what is important, that org chart, that's the baseline for understanding this passage and what's going on here because King Agrippa violates the org, org chart. That's what he does. In the last message, we saw that he moved from Jerusalem to Caesarea because he had arrested Peter. He put 16 guards in charge of protecting him. They, they, uh, they failed in their task because an angelic a being came and rescued him out of prison and got him out of there. And so embarrassed by that, Agrippa says, I'm leaving town. And he leaves Jerusalem and he goes down to the coast to Caesarea. And 
and we get this historical notation as he's ruling now from Caesarea, we get this historical notation from Luke that Agrippa, this is verse 20, was angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon. This is some trade dispute that's going on with these two cities. These two cities are called free cities and they're right on the coast um, and, and just north of Caesarea where Agrippa is now based. So it's a trade dispute of some kind. This delegation evidently comes to him. They come to him with one accord. So they're agreed on a solution. The people of Tyre and Sidon, they come up with some idea. They're going to come down and meet with Agrippa to see if they can work this out. And, and they, they, they persuaded Blastus. And, and by the way, Blastus is a great name if, if you're pregnant right now and looking for baby names. This should definitely be on top 10 baby names list. Just as nine o'clock, I offer $20 to any couple who names their son Blastus this year. <laughs> 20, 20 bucks. Um, but they persuade Blastus. Blastus works for Herod, for, for Agrippa. He's one of his government officials, a chamberlain. And, and together they come and they ask for peace because they were in a tough spot. Because, because their country depended on the king's country for food. They're just two cities on the coast, two free cities on the coast. And they depend on the agricultural areas uh, for, their, uh, for their food. And, and, um, and just like all cities, all cities depend on farmers, you know, for their food. You've seen, uh, no doubt, this a sign or sticker somewhere, but um, it's going to appear right now. There it is. You've seen this before. Farmers feed cities. Farmers feed cities. And Tyre and Sidon were like, farmers feed cities and we're having a fight with Agrippa and he controls all the farmland. We gotta make up with him. We gotta find some way to make good with him. And so they sense their vulnerability and they know that Agrippa controls all the areas that feed them. And, and, and we pause at this point to ask the question, why in the world does Luke include this story of a trade dispute between Tyre and Sidon and, and Agrippa in, in Caesarea, why does he include this? It's to show the kind of power that Agrippa had. It's to show his influence over the, ter to the territories he controlled, but also the surrounding areas that he did not. He's influential. He has the favor of Rome and of the Caesar with whom he is a personal friend. And so Luke writes in verse 21 concerning all of this, on an appointed day as they work out this agreement, and, and according to Josephus, and Josephus is a Jewish historian, this was a festival in honor of Caesar. And there may have been games that were actually attached to this because the Romans loved having the games. And so in the midst of this, Herod put on his royal robes, took his seat upon the throne, and delivered an oration to them. And in fact, I want you to hear a little bit more of what Josephus says along with the passage that we're reading. Jerome, have you got that? I know you always bring Josephus to church on Sundays, so thanks, Jerome. So this is, uh, this is uh, Jerome's a big history guy, big ancient history guy, loves bringing Josephus with him. So this is Josephus. How many people have heard of the historian Josephus? Just raise your hand. So he often gets quoted, he'll get quoted in in uh, sermons like this, he, he's a Jewish historian. He's not a Christian. He's a Jewish historian. And what he was doing is he was just writing about all the history of the Jews. In fact, the book, the main book that I'm quoting from here this morning is from what's called The Antiquity of the Jews. And it's made up of several books and several volumes. And, um, and, and listen to this entry, though, because it parallels perfectly with what Luke is reporting to us. And Luke, among New Testament authors, Luke's all about the details. He's a medical doctor. He's, he loves the science behind things. He loves the history and the details of what's going on. He provides more details than anyone else. Trivia point, he wrote more of the New Testament than anyone else in terms of number of words written in his gospel and the book of Acts. And so Luke's about details. Josephus is a historian. Here's what Josephus writes, this is in your notes, but not on the screen. About verse 21, Josephus wrote, he put on a garment made wholly of silver and of a contexture truly wonderful and came into the theater in the morning, at which time the silver of his garment being illuminated by the fresh reflection of the sun's rays upon it shone out after a surprising manner and was so resplendent as to spread a, a horror over those that looked intently upon him. And that word horror should be better translated today in our regular language. They were in awe of it. They were in awe of him as this silver garment shone in the sunlight. 
that's Josephus telling us about the same event that Luke is reporting on. And Luke says it this way, verse 22, the people were shouting in the midst of this, the voice of a God and not of a man. And Josephus backs it up and he says this, and presently his flatterers cried out that he was a God. And they added, be thou merciful to us, for although we have hitherto reverenced, reverenced thee only as a man, yet shall we henceforth own thee as superior to mortal nature. Now, simply put, both Luke and Josephus are pointing to it. Herod forgot who he was. Herod forgot that he was a human being. Intoxicated by power, he allowed the people to exalt him to a place that no human being belongs. But also a place that we, according to our nature, seek after in so many different ways. And God is glorified in me when I know I am human, when I know that I am created by God, when I know that I am created by God in his image, and when I know that my life should be given to glorifying him and not glorifying me. Thanks for loaning me your history of Josephus, Jerome. It was awesome. So I know who I am, and I glorify God when I also know who he is. When I know who he is. Herod also, in, 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 in addition to being confused about himself, he's confused about God. He didn't have any sense of who God is, and this was natural. His, his family's identification with Israel was very pragmatic, and it was not based on the fact that they were Jews because they weren't. They weren't from Israel. They were Edomites. Now, they had the same, some of the same ancestors. They, had, they both had Abraham as their ancestor. They both had Isaac as their ancestor. But Isaac had uh, two sons, Jacob and Esau. And from Jacob came the Jews. And from Esau came the Edomites. And that's where Herod's family is from. And throughout the New Testament, you hear reference to various Herods. The Herod we're reading about here is not the same Herod that we read about at the birth of Christ. Herod's like the last name. It's the family name or it's the dynastic name. It would be like saying that uh, King Charles is from the house of Windsor. This is the house of Herod or the Herodian dynasty. And so you see the word Herod used throughout Agrippa. This is Agrippa I that we're reading about, and he's one of the Herodians. And again, they're Edomites. They're not Jews. And so Yahweh for them, Yahweh was not about personal faith. Yahweh was about political interests. They had no heartfelt attachment to the Lord at all. And so as he's hearing this chant from the crowd, rather than pointing to Yahweh, rather than, rather than deflecting the praise to him, he soaks it in. He doesn't really know who Yahweh is. He doesn't really know who God is. And he doesn't know because he doesn't know the scriptures. He doesn't know how God deals with people. This is so important. He doesn't know how God deals with people who steal his glory. Prophet Isaiah records this from the Lord. I am the Lord. That is my name. My glory I give to no other. And a believing Jew would know that verse. They would know the first commandment to have no other gods before him. And a believing Jew would know you don't mess with God. And Agrippa doesn't know that. And Josephus records this. He says, upon this, the king did neither rebuke them nor reject their impious flattery. Even the historian a Jewish man knew that what he had done was wrong. In verse 23, he says, immediately an angel of the Lord struck him down. Not, not instantly dead, but immediately afflicted with a terminal illness. And the reason is given because he did not give God the glory. God is judging him on the spot. It came in an instant. And then note the order of how this then played out in his life. He was first eaten by worms and second breathed his last. But the order of that is important because we tend to think, you know, we die, they put us in the ground, we're eaten by worms. You think about that, right? Nervous laugh, laughter ripples through the crowd, right? 
We, we tend to think of it that way, that he died. Oh, yeah, he died and he was eaten by worms. But no, look at the order. He was eaten by worms and then he died. So the death he died was by worms. He died by worms. If you're getting uncomfortable with this, just raise your hand. I just want to acknowledge it. I'm not stopping. I'm just, it's just good for me to know some people are uncomfortable. So he died by worms, and this could have either been the primary cause of death. In other words, the worms ate him from the inside out, and that became obvious to people. Or it was a secondary affliction, secondary infection that was happening in his life. Josephus records this about his death. Josephus said a severe pain also arose in his belly and began in a most violent manner. His pain was, beco was become violent. Accordingly, he was carried into the palace. And when he had been quite worn out by the pain in his belly for five days, he departed this life. I read extensively on what happened to him here, and it was gruesome. And I thought about just reading it and throwing some pictures up on the screen. But I'm not dumb. So I didn't do that, but I wanted to share it with someone, so I sent it to the pastoral team in a text message for them to read, though I, I did not send any pictures. Um, for the record, some of them thought I should just read it, but I didn't. But let's hear, let's hear now, because this is a gruesome way to die. That's what we can agree on. It's a gruesome way to die, and in such a public fashion, and so obviously the judgment of God. And in this, we need to hear and heed the warning that's here for us. We may not receive the adulation that Agrippa did, and we may not so flagrantly attempt to steal the glory of God, but you and I still do it in all kinds of subtle ways, some not so subtle, but certainly much less pu public than what happened here with Herod. So I made a list, eight ways. Eight ways I steal glory from God. You see if any of these apply to you. Eight ways I steal God's glory. First of all, I, I boast in my accomplishment. I take credit for what I've done in my life and what I have in my life. Rather than saying, you know, like I've been so blessed and God has done it all. I have a great marriage. I have great kids. I, I, God's given me a great job. I have so much in my life and giving him the glory, recognizing that there are people just like you who don't have what you have. And you have been adva advantaged by the awesome blessings of God. His grace, unmerited and unearned, has come to you. You need to acknowledge that, that you're healthy, that tragedy hasn't been befallen you, that your marriage stayed together that your family is intact, that you have money in the bank, that you have a great house that you live in. Give God the glory for these things. Don't take credit for any of that. I boast in my accomplishments. I steal glory from God. Secondly, I complain about my life. When you complain about your life, you are saying to God, you got it wrong. He's sovereign. He's over everything. Remember the org chart? He's up here and we're down here. I don't like this in my life. I don't like this in my life. This isn't going well. God, you got it wrong. You steal glory from him. Thirdly, I dismiss the miraculous. I believe in only what can be explained rationally. This is the, the cult of science. I believe Christians should pursue science. I believe they should become researchers and, and look deeply into the way the natural world works because when you do that and you exalt the Lord, what you're looking at is the way God made it. You're looking into the intricacies of God's creation. You're not disproving him. You're proving him through the sciences. Christians are not anti-science. We're anti the cult of science, which elevates that on the org chart, takes the natural world and puts it above God. God is at the top. We steal glory from him when we dismiss the miraculous. We, we steal the glory from him when, when we think that we're indispensable to God. I think I'm indispensable to God in my ministry position, and God needs me. God needs me. Listen, Cheryl and, and my mom 
uh, and I went to uh, two funerals yesterday. As, as things turned out, we hit one in Woodstock and then one down in St. Thomas. And these are longtime friends, people we had served with. One man uh, was, uh, the, one, the man was a, a longtime elder two or more decades at the church that we previously served in. I sat on the elders board with him. Um, he was a good and godly man and close personal friends of ours. Uh, the other woman was a colleague of ours in the Christian school and in the church in which we served. And, and both of them in their 80s, both of them spent a lifetime serving Jesus. Both funerals glorified Jesus Christ uh, by talking about the life of these two phenomenal Christian people. And what was stunning about it is, is that um, just to think about the people that were not there at the funeral, people that didn't come. And I thought about this. They'd lived this faithful life for eight decades, faithfully serving Jesus. And already they're being forgotten. Already people are just, oh, yeah. And, and I, I remember seeing this line, and I can't credit it to anybody, but I'm sure someone more recently said this. But, you know, in 100 years, we think of ourselves so indispensable, but in 100 years, all new people. In 100 years, all new people. We think so much of ourselves, and we just ought not to. Because none of us are indispensable. Number five, I consider myself better than others. I consider myself more talented, more influential, more beautiful, more important. And because of all of that, that's, this is why social media exists, okay? Because I believe these things. And I want to tell people about these things. And I'm not at the center of the story. None of us are. Christ is at the center. Seven, I reinterpret. I reinterpret the word to suit my own desires or to align the word with my lifestyle choices. So I'm like, oh yeah, and like, I know the Bible says that, but I, I, it doesn't mean that anymore. That doesn't mean that to me. And I reinterpret the scriptures to suit myself, and that steals the glory from God. And this eighth one, I, I believe that my good works help save and or keep me in the faith, and that is a perversion of the gospel. It is, it is um, by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any of us should boast, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. And this is entirely a work of God. It's entirely a work of God to save us. You're not adding anything to it. We're not, we're not doing any penance. We're not doing any indulgences. We're not uh, saying any specific prayers. We're, we're not making any sacrifices or offerings or any of the ritualistic sacramental things that uh, some other faith groups would have you do in order to plus faith, faith plus these things. It's not faith plus anything. It's faith in Jesus Christ, period. That's the whole thing. And um, Jonah 2, 9 says this, uh, salvation, salvation is of the Lord. Psalm 37, 39 says the same. Salvation is of the Lord. It comes from him and we do nothing to contribute to it. So, so if we steal glory from God, if we're guilty of, of one or all eight of these things, the reality is God probably will not send worms to eat you. As good news that's good news. He probably is not going to send worms to eat you. But if you're a glory hog and you are not saved, you can look at this account and you can say, I'm in the same position as Herod. I'm in danger of the judgment of God for stealing glory from him. And if you are a Christian and you have professed faith in Christ, done what these, these kids did today in being baptized, you've professed your faith in Christ, and you're a Christian and you're stealing glory from God then, then you will not find, fall under eternal judgment, but you may fall under the discipline of God, and that's, just, that's uncomfortable. And a good thing to do would be to repent of that before you leave, leave the room today. Don't put yourself in a position where God needs to discipline you. And in contrast to what we see from Agrippa here, if, if you fast forward to Acts 14, and we'll get there, in a few weeks, the, the crowd in Lystra who witnessed a miracle, this is Paul and Barnabas, they're out on their, their first missionary journey, they go out and, and they see this miracle done and all of a sudden they think Paul and Barnabas are Zeus and Hermes. They think they're two of the Greek gods. And so they start praising them, the priest from the temple comes up and he's offering sacrifices to them and they could have in that moment been like Herod and like just soaked it all in. But they didn't. 
Their response instead was this. This is Acts 14, 14 and 15. They tore their garments and they rushed out in the crowd crying, men, why are you doing these things? We also are men of nature with you, of like nature with you. And we bring you good news that you should turn from these vain things, Zeus and Hermes, to a living God who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. They gave God the glory. And that's what Agrippa should have done. As soon as the people started lauding him, he should have thrown off that silver robe that he was wearing and, and cast the crown off of his head. And he should have rushed into the crowd and said, I'm just a man like you. Give God the glory. We need not worry about Agrippa or the world's leaders because, listen, the world is full of Herods today. We don't have to worry about their predisposition to usurping God's place. John Stott said, tyrants may be permitted for a time to boast and bluster oppressing the church and hindering the spread of the gospel, but they will not last. In the end, their empire will be broken and their pride abased. So don't worry about world leaders. In fact, don't worry about anybody else. Just think about yourself. Think hard about yourself. Every time we're tempted to become a glory hog, we should do what Paul and Barnabas did. Tear our clothes and rush into the crowd and say we're men and women just like you. We should think back to the org chart where we belong on it as image bearers of God, reflecting his glory and not our own. We've, we've defined glory in this way. It's hard to define, but the glory of God is the manifestation of his holiness. It is the radiance of all that he is in his absolute perfection being revealed. And that manifestation, that revealing of God should be seen not simply in the creation around us, but in us. We are designed by the creator to reflect his image even as we understand, because we do this imperfectly, but we understand the earthly reality that sin has marred the perfection of the creation. And so we're, we're more often than not poor reflections of the glory of God until that day we receive our, our glorified bodies in eternity, as Romans 8 and 30 tells us. So yeah, we're poor reflections of his glory, but nevertheless, this is the thing we strive for. This is what our purpose in life is, is to bring God, God the glory. And so the, the antidote, if we think about those eight ways that we steal glory from God, and we go like, I gotta do some work on this. And we could think about eight individual solutions to this, but I, I thought it would be easier to boil it all down to just one. And to look at the humility that we see the exemplified in Jesus Christ in his taking on human flesh and, and becoming like us and giving his life. And no more beautiful passage on that than, than, than Philippians 2, one to, or 5 to 11. And I'm just going to read this. And you think about this because this is, this, is the, this is the script. This is the prescription. This is the thing that solves the problem of the eight ways we, we steal glory from God. Just do this. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant and being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen? Amen. God is glorified. God is glorified when I know who I am, when I know who he is. And thirdly, see this, when I know what he says. So we see Luke's summary here, verse 24. He kind of gets through the whole thing about the trade dispute and then what Herod did and his death. But the word of God increased and multiplied. And it seems like an odd statement. It's kind of counterintuitive to us to kind of see what has been happening since Acts chapter six until this time and to say, like, like how in the world is the word continuing to increase and multiply? 
It's counterintuitive to see such vicious and violent opposition and yet greater expansion and multiplication, momentum in the, in the ministry and the mission. Because the logic kind of goes this way. Stephen was martyred. He was brutal. Were you there? They threw stones at him until he died. James was arrested and they beheaded him. The apostles have been arrested and imprisoned and beaten now on multiple occasions and thousands and thousands of believers have been displaced from their homes and had to scatter all around the area in fear of being persecuted in like manner. And so I think I'd like to be a believer too because that all sounds awesome. I mean, who wouldn't want to be part of that? Who wouldn't want to believe in something and immediately know it could result in your death? It's so attractive, isn't it? Why would anyone sign up for this? And there's two answers. The, the one is the behind the scenes answer as to why anybody would want to be a part of it. There's a behind the scenes divine answer, the divine perspective, and then there's the upfront, the thing we see, the human perspective. And the divine perspective is this, that God's offer of salvation is irresistible. God's offer of salvation is irresistible. At the moment that you become a follower of Jesus Christ, listen, listen, you are going to become a follower of Jesus Christ. And you heard the gospel, and in that moment, when I was 15 years old, I heard the gospel in a dark room at a youth event, and I raised my hand, and that raising of my hand was an irresistible move of the Holy Spirit in my life to save me. I couldn't stop it. And, 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 and if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, that's what happened to you. You were drawn by the Holy Spirit to be saved. When he calls, you come. That's the heavenly perspective, the divine perspective. The ground level human perspective is that we're all, every human being is looking for meaning and purpose and identity in life. We want our lives to count for something. We, we want them to mean something and to matter. And the gospel shows us how to get there. And people were living their lives and going, these people are giving their lives for Jesus Christ. I want in. I don't care if my life is shortened by this. I want the years I have left to matter for eternity. I want to believe something as strongly as they believe it. Gospel shows us how to get there. The church carried out the mission to teach the word, and, and, and that was the whole thing. It's a mission to take the gospel. It's a mission to take the word of God and tell anyone who will listen about God's words of life. And when we do that, when we, when we just put the word out there, do you know that everything else falls into place if we just open the word? We're so committed to, let's get the word open. Let's start at the first verse. Let's work verse by verse through this entire book. Let's not skip anything. Let's not round off any edges. Let's not sugarcoat it. Let's not make it soft and palatable so people can chew on it. Let's make it hard. Let's preach exactly what's there. When we come to a really hard part, we're not gonna skip over it. We're gonna talk about all the things that the gospel would have us talk about. We're gonna open the word of God. And when you do that and the Holy Spirit starts working, you're not afraid of any part of the word of God. You're not even afraid of people walking away if you say a hard thing. You're not. I tell you, if you do that, all the other stuff in ministry starts to fall into, into place and, and it accomplishes God's will. And this beautiful verse in Isaiah 55, God says this about his word. So shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. We just need to get the word out and it's always going to accomplish God's will. God is glorified when we simply get his word out as we've been commissioned and commanded to do. Preach it, proclaim it, share it, teach it. Disciple people, mentor them, train them in righteousness. Spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. Tell everybody you know that Jesus Christ gave his life on the cross, point them to the cross of Jesus Christ and to the empty tomb. And if we do that, his will will be accomplished and his name will be glorified. And that relates to this last point, God's glorified when I know what I'm to be doing. 
Back in chapter 11, verses 27 through 30, Paul and Barnabas had been given this mission. The Antioch church had collected an offering. Uh, Agabus had given this prophecy about a famine that was coming. They knew that the Jerusalem church was gonna be impoverished and be affected by it. So they, they collected this offering. They said, Paul and Barnabas, would you take this money down to Jerusalem? And so that's the kind of backstory to verse 25. Barnabas and Paul returned from Jerusalem when they had completed their service, taking the offering to them. And heading back to Antioch, they brought John Mark with them. John Mark, we, we were introduced to last week. His mom was hosting the prayer meeting while, while Peter was in prison. So now he's going with Paul and Barnabas to Antioch. And we're gonna see the three of them in chapter 13 sent off into the first intentional mission to the Gentile world. And, and between chapters 12 and 13, we see a shift. Up until this time, we've been really focused on the apostles and Peter specifically. In chapter 13 and on, it's gonna be all about Paul uh, toward the end, till, till the end of the book. And all of that to say, what am I to be doing? We need to ask ourselves that question. What am I doing, doing? What am I doing to glorify God with respect to the mission to spread this gospel? Because every single person has a part to play. Every one of us, according to our gifts and our passions, our abilities. Every one of us is, Acts 1a, we're all gonna be his witnesses. Matthew, Matthew 28, 19 and 20, we're all gonna go into the world in some respect, in some way, and make disciples of all nations. How are you glorifying God with your service? Are you completing your mission as Paul and Barnabas were completing theirs? They had a mission. Ours isn't like theirs. It's different. It's still gospel, but we're going to come according to our gifts, our time, our culture. Am I grateful to God for calling me into this mission as so many in this church are? And, and I have so much gratitude in my own heart for those who have committed themselves to this in our Harvest family. So many of you give God the glory in how you serve, in your witness, in your invitation to people to come, in your service in the church, in your giving to fund the ministry, in your prayers, in your attentiveness to the word, in your care and, and concern and compassion and love for others, in your expression of worship. You are glorifying God. A disciple at Harvest, we define in terms of four W's. A disciple of Christ worships Christ, walks with Christ, works for Christ, and witnesses for Christ. And are you doing that? Are you growing in accomplishing that mission of every single disciple in each of our own context? The catechism says humanity's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. Our mission statement is that we exist to glorify God through the making of more and better disciples of Jesus Christ. And all of that is to say that's the reason why we're here. That's our purpose. It's to glorify God. Are you doing that? Are you pointing to Jesus Christ rather than to yourself? The church stands on the reformers phrase, soli deo gloria, the glory to the glory of God alone. And that's how we live it out. Glory to God alone. No other gods before him. Amen? Let me pray. Father, again, you have been... Um, incredibly kind to us in giving us your word and speaking to us with great clarity. And Father, there's no escaping your word. It will accomplish the thing for which you sent it in the heart of every person in this room, everyone who's watching online, all those who will watch on demand. Father, your word will accomplish what you want it to. I pray we'll do that. I pray it'll do it for believers in this room who need to repent of ways that they have stolen glory from you. And I pray, God, it will, it will be effective in the lives of those who are not yet Christian, not yet given their life to Jesus Christ. That any, even in this very moment, God, they would make their pledge. They would seek the forgiveness of their sins. They would look to the cross and to the empty tomb and find life in Christ. Father, this is a work that you, only you can do. I pray that you would do it. We're, we're humbled and, and privileged, Father, to be able to witness it and to be a part of it. 
We give you the glory in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior.